Oops. <laughs> Hold on one second. Resume the recording. And uh, welcome uh, Professor Raywat Dayanandan. He's an associate professor at the University of Ottawa. Um, he's an epidemiologist, and I notice his bio says a public health communicator. And uh, we have been uh, we've been the beneficiaries. I mean, the Canadian public, I think, has been the beneficiaries of a lot of your public health communicating <laughs> over the last couple of years since COVID. But us in PAFSO, we have particularly benefited from uh, from this. And this will be this is your third appearance, I think, with us. Last time was around the same time last year, where we asked you again to tell us, you know, what was going on with the. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic and what we could expect and what we should be doing. And I am really happy and grateful that you agreed to come back and talk to us again, because I think um, a lot of us are in the position where we are, um, we, we're looking for some guidance <laughs> and uh, we're really, really happy to, to have you here with us. Um, just, I just wanted to flag to people if they want to use the Q&A bu uh, button at the bottom for questions, we will, I'll keep an eye on them. But um, Raywat is going to do a, pres a short presentation, and then we will, um, I'll keep an eye in case there are any sort of hot pursuit type questions. But in general, I think we'll, you know, we'll let him run through his, his slides and then open the floor. And since it looks like I see 11 participants in the chat, we had about 40 some registered. But since it's relatively few of you, what I'll do when we get to the Q&A is I will open up I'll, I'll invite you to be a panelist if you would like to talk, or you know if you prefer, you can always use the the Q and A button. But um, it might give him a little bit less of a feeling that he's uh, you know uh, talking into the into the ether. I will be here, but I'm going to turn off my camera just so that you don't see my face interfering with everything, and I'm going to stop my screen sharing so that you can put up your um, your slides if you if you like. Great, thank you very much. First of all, uh, thanks for having me again. It's always a pleasure to speak to this group in particular because you're a, a well-informed, intelligent group. Uh, not that I'm sucking up, but you are. And so the probability of me receiving hate mail afterwards is much less. So I always look forward to that. So um, uh, as, you, as you can see, I'm not on vacation. This is a virtual background. I have a two-year-old running around and an annoying dog. And I might have to get up at some point to let the dog out of my office because he keeps running back and forth. That's my life. <laughs> okay, I'm going to share my screen because I got some slides here. Let me see if I got the right one going. Here we go. Okay, you can all see my uh, my handsome, well-groomed face in front of, uh, front of the camera there. Excellent. So uh, as mentioned, this is my third time speaking to you nice folks. Last time was October of last year. I think I made some projections back then. I didn't look at what I said. Probably everything I said was wrong because something happened fall of last year that threw everybody off and that is omicron showed up in december and that changed the game a lot it compromised vaccine effectiveness which i'll talk about and made the disease really really contagious so up until december of last year very few people <clears throat> not very few but a, a minority of people had been infected now it seems everybody you know is getting infected several times a month almost mm -hmm. so uh without further delay let us begin I'm going to talk uh, briefly about what I think the state of the pandemic is, uh, a little bit about vaccines, a little bit about testing, because there's some confusion around rapid testing and do they still apply, um, whether or not you should avoid being reinfected, and I can't really answer that question, but I can tell you what the experts are thinking, and uh, what tools we can continue to use to mitigate our own exposures for the next few months and possibly years, and uh, hopefully there'll be many questions afterwards, because I intend on running through these questions quickly to leave a lot of space for a conversation at the end. Okay, the state of the pandemic, something I'm asked about every week by a journalist. What is the state of the pandemic? Who knows, who knows? Let's go through some slides. This is what we're looking at right now in Canada. As you can see, we've had multiple waves. I think we're on our seventh, ending our seventh wave now. And the big one was the first Omicron wave at the end of December, early January. And we had a small one this past summer that's coming to an end now. Um, will there be an eighth wave in Canada in the fall? Uh, many experts think so because we have lifted all restrictions. 
and because the vaccination rate among certain populations is still relatively low, and also because vaccination doesn't perfectly prevent infection. So given the high amounts of circulating virus and the fact that we're letting it circulate, there's a good probability that will be another wave of infections. Now, will there be another wave of deaths? That's another story entirely. This is what the death curve looked like in Canada. Let me back up for a second and point out that since we stopped doing a lot of testing earlier this year, this infection graph is suspect. Right? So there's probably a lot more cases than we're capturing in these graphs, so keep that in mind. So the death graph, on the other hand, is pretty accurate because we know fairly well when someone has died. Uh, very often we don't know if they died of COVID, that's why we look at the excess deaths. We can talk about that if, if you like. But based upon the death curve, it follows the same trend, the uh, seven waves, the current wave coming to an end now. And interestingly, the, the peaks of a current wave is a little less than the, the spring wave. Um, people are still dying. They're dying less than they did in terms of rates in previous waves because of vaccination, but they're dying in large numbers because more people are becoming infected. The IHME, the um, Institute for Health Evaluation and Metrics, Metrics and Evaluation, does some pretty good modeling. And they suggest that Canada is looking at an increase in infections in this fall. So this is the dreaded eighth wave that's probably coming. Um, globally, the new cases are following a similar trend. We're coming off of a global wave at the moment, again, subject to the limitations of testing, which are real. But in terms of deaths, the deaths have been coming down for a long time globally. I mean, there's a slight uh, increase over the summer, but look at that. Since uh, early part of this year, they've been coming down a lot, which suggests that the teeth of the pandemic are blunted. And I say that hesitatingly because I don't want people to think that this is not a mortal threat anymore. It is at a population level, but individually because of the awesome power of vaccination, um, we are no longer individually terrified for our lives although we probably should be concerned for a long-term health because of long COVID, which we can talk about later on. So this is, uh, again, the IHME projections for the global infection. And we see that uh, globally, um, they're looking at an eighth or another wave um, this fall. So globally, the deaths, as I mentioned, have been coming down and they're projected to continue to come down and to plateau somewhere around the 2,000 a day mark, which is not nothing, but it's certainly less than it was at uh, 16,000 back in January of 2021. So in case you think I'm posting a, a rosy picture here of the pandemic, and there is a lot of optimism there, uh, the death rates are coming down, the teeth of the, of the disease have been blunted, but in Ontario, at least 16 kids have been known to have died um, due, of the pandemic. Um, and those are kids under 12. And as noted here, 13 died in 2022, despite the fact that these teeth have been blunted. And nine of those 13 had their infection during the spring of 2022. So that underlines the fact that this is still a dangerous disease. And these um, and the uh, pediatric vaccination rates are low. So that's probably part of what's going on here. In Ontario, we're still posting 100 deaths a week, which is not nothing to sneeze at. And we're probably seeing 10 times more infections now than we did this time last year based upon some modeling that attempts to account for the fact that we're not testing as much anymore. Okay, so on that uh, rosy and less than rosy picture, let's talk about vaccines. Everything, everybody uh, thinks they're a vaccine expert. <laughs> so let's see how much I am uh, one. This is the global map of vaccine distribution of the rate of vaccine uptake of uh, doses per 100 people. Unsurprisingly, <clears throat> wealthy countries and you know, higher middle income countries are more likely to be well vaccinated. Uh, Africa is the least vaccinated part of the world. Interestingly, Russia struggles with vaccination rates. They have a lot of vaccine hesitancy there. If we look at the boosters uh, that have been administered, we see again, more likely to receive them in wealthier nations. Interestingly, we have uh, Japan, and uh, Chile and Argentina being uh, well boosted as well. Uh, Israel and Western Europe are also well boosted. But are these vaccines working? Well, that's a complicated question. And the answer is yes, 
Yes, they're working, despite what people might be saying online. They're working extremely, extraordinarily well. Yes, we all know people who've been four dose and yet still got COVID multiple times because the vaccines don't prevent infection as well as they did in the past, but they're still preventing a lot of people from getting seriously sick and being uh, hospitalized or put in the morgue. So that is the short answer. The long answer is ideally a vaccine offers sterilizing immunity. That's when it prevents infection in the first place. That's the holy grail. It's actually rarely observed in, in many vaccines. Sometimes um, we get uh, protection against symptomatic disease, which is pretty good. If you can avoid symptoms, then you can probably avoid passing it on to other people. Um, we don't know how well this prevents asymptomatic infection because we don't test everybody all the time. If you haven't got symptoms, why would you get tested? But uh, we think the ability to prevent asymptomatic infection has been compromised by Omicron. Prior to Omicron, it was like really good. It was really good at preventing asymptomatic infection and transmission. But Omicron has changed that. The, the vaccines are still extraordinarily good at preventing serious disease and hospitalization and death. Not perfect, but very good. Keep in mind, there's gonna be some biases in the data. Um, the people who are most likely to be highly, highly vaccinated are those who are most likely to die. So the extremely elderly, the, the sick, they're the ones who are first in line to get uh, additional doses. Um, they're also the ones who are most likely to die. And so that's going to bias the data a little bit, even with that bias in place. Uh, there's extraordinarily good data signal that these vaccines prevent the worst outcomes. So here's an example from Switzerland showing that the unvaccinated have an extremely higher chance of dying. These are rates, death rates, than the fully vaccinated or indeed the boosted. The boosted have uh, the least likelihood of dying. Um, now the pushback is going to be that this includes people who, uh, who died before their vaccinations available. So of course that group is going to be higher. No, it doesn't. This is weekly death rates. So this is actually a pure comparison in Switzerland. This is data from Washington State showing the um, age adjusted rate over time. So in other words, you, we accounted for the fact that um, some age groups are more likely to be infected than others. And sure enough, we see over time, those who are not fully vaccinated are far more likely to be infected than those who are um, fully vaccinated. Okay? The, the fully vaccinated are the ones holding down, in fact, the, uh, the case rate. New York City has interesting data. Up until the arrival of Omicron, we saw the, um, the death rates were extremely high er, amongst the not fully vaccinated versus the vaccinated. And then even including the Omicron data in, in Seattle, we see um, the vaccination death rate is minuscule compared to the unvaccinated. So get vaccinated if you haven't already and encourage your friends to do so as well. Interesting data out of Israel recently. Uh, I'm asked all the time, do, uh, does getting boosted as a fourth dose improve your condition? Yes, it does. So here's a sample from a very good study out of Israel recently showing a comparison between those who got four doses versus those who only got three doses. And this is the cumulative incidence of COVID over time. So as more time since your fourth dose passes, uh, the gap between the likelihood of getting COVID and not getting COVID widens between those who got four doses versus three doses. It's still not extraordinarily good protection against infection, but it's better than no protection at all. And certainly four doses is better than three doses, which is better than zero doses. You shouldn't bank on vaccines preventing you from getting infected though. It's good, um, but you should bank on them preventing the worst possible outcomes. There is a really interesting study out of California this past uh, summer. Um, it's still undergoing peer review, but it's got a lot of people excited. What they did, they looked at prisoners and their cellmates and looked at um, prisoners who got COVID and whether or not they infected their cellmates some weeks afterwards. And they found that if you had at least one vaccination dose, you were 24% less likely to infect your cellmate. You can't get much closer than cellmate, right? Um, now, if you were infected before, you're 21% less likely because infection does confer some element of, of protection. And if you're infected and 
got vaccinated, you're 41% less likely to pass on the virus. We call that hybrid immunity, a combination of vaccination plus infection. It might matter what you were infected with. It might matter if you're infected with uh, Omicron versus Alpha and Delta and previous variants. And I think I've got a slide about that. Um, before I do, uh, I do wanna talk about something called the base rate fallacy. And I talked about this last fall as well. I cannot stress this enough. The anti-vax narrative always looks at the number of people in the hospital and the number of people who are dead and looked at, oh my goodness, uh, the majority of hospitalized people have are vaccinated. So clearly the vaccines are making things worse or the majority of dead people are vaccinated. Clearly the vaccines are killing people. Um, in some jurisdictions, it is true that the majority of the dead people are vaccinated recently. And it is definitely true that the majority of hospitalized people are vaccinated. That's because the majority of people are vaccinated. We call this the base rate fallacy. So if you look at um, the, here is a, a is simulation data. You have a bunch of people who are vaccinated, two of them get COVID. A bunch of people who are unvaccinated, two of them get COVID. If you only looked at those who got COVID, you'd say, oh, amongst those who got COVID, half have been vaccinated. Clearly, vaccines do shit. Not true. A tiny proportion of the vaccinated got COVID. A larger proportion of the unvaccinated got COVID. We have to look at the proportions. We call that the rate or, or the risk, not the, the distribution, which is the outcome member. So that is the base rate fallacy. This, this chart shows it better. So if you only looked at the hospitalization rate, you'd see, oh my goodness, there are a lot more vaccinated people than there are unvaccinated. Clearly, vaccines are making things worse. You hear this a lot, probably hear it amongst your friends. And, um, but if you look at it in a larger sense, it's a tiny proportion of the vaccinated versus a large proportion of the unvaccinated. So there is much greater risk of becoming hospitalized if you're unvaccinated. For a while, we're saying this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Um, that's not really true because again, the, the hospitalized cases are vaccinated. But if no one were vaccinated, then these numbers would be insanely huge because uh, the, the number of people from this group would be so much more. So vaccination prevents the worst outcome and has so far been the thing that has been holding back the collapse of our healthcare system. I hope I've made my case, vaccination good, get vaccinated. Now, the immunity from natural infection debate rages on. Um, I do a lot of consulting with uh, you know, law firms who are representing a variety of clients um, some of whom are claiming that, you know, why must I be subject to a vaccine mandate? I was infected already, that's good enough. The data is variable. It depends which data you look at, frankly. Here's a, a study out of Qatar, uh, Qatar, how do you pronounce it, Qatar, um, that found that infection with alpha and delta offered relatively high protection against further infection, but infection with Omicron was like half, half of that protection. Uh, and again, uh, the combination of vaccination is your best bet. So it's unclear if an Omicron infection confers any kind of lasting protection. It might, it might not. I, I've seen data going both ways. It was clearer that infection with previous variants was fairly effective. Um, having said that, I would never advocate for natural infection. Getting infected naturally comes with illness, risk of death, risk of infection, risk of long-term disability. And it might matter what your viral road was. So if you had an, you know, a very light infection, maybe you didn't mount much of an immune response and maybe you don't have much of a lasting immunity. Um, so there's a lot of variability in that natural infection response. Whereas if you're vaccinated, that dose has been calibrated to give you the optimal antibody production. Okay, let's talk now about testing. Now, everyone's done these tests already. They know all about them. They, and uh, people are starting to trust them less and they shouldn't. The tests work fairly well, these rapid tests. Here is the nuance that a lot of people miss on the rapid test. The rapid tests are testing something different from the PCR test. So this uh, graph shows us um, how much viral load you have as you progress through your infection. So let's say you get infected here. Um, suddenly you start producing more virus in your body. Right about here is when you start producing so much virus that you can infect other people. This is when you become dangerous. It's also when 
you are detectable by the rapid test. So your viral load peaks and it comes down as you recover. You're still detectable, still detectable. Suddenly, you're not detectable anymore, but you're still infected. Are you infectious though? Probably not. You haven't got enough viral load to be a threat to other people, but you're still infected. And the PCR test will continue to say that you're infected. So the rapid test detects infectiousness and the PCR detects, do you have any presence of virus in your system at all? Maybe you got infected like months ago and you're fine now, but the PCR is so sensitive, it can detect really a, a very low uh, concentration of remnants of RNA. So you hear things bandied about like sensitivity of the rapid test is low, uh, which is true, depending upon what you're comparing it to. And very often they're comparing it to the PCR, which to my mind is not a relevant comparison. Um, long story short, if you're testing positive on a rapid test, I think it's, pretty, it's a pretty solid bet that you are still infectious and should stay away from people. If you're testing negative on a rapid test and you got symptoms and all your friends are positive, yeah, test again. Yeah. Uh, don't take the negative test to the bank, but take the positive test to the bank, absolutely. Um, having said that, there are some pretty good studies showing that if you were to do rapid testing before going to a social event, for example, um, you can reduce the probability of increasing transmission by 50%. It's not perfect, but does it do a good job? There's a, a twist though with the rapid testing, and that is vaccines in the wake of Omicron have changed the game. So Michael Mina, who is the uh, rapid testing guru, uh, created this graph uh, that's been shared far and wide. And he shows that if you haven't been vaccinated, then your progress through the disease looks like the graph I just showed you. You get exposed to the virus, you build up viral load, you start getting symptoms as you are infectious, and as your infectiousness wanes, your symptoms abate. So from you, your perspective, you don't know if you should take a test until you get symptoms, right? So you take a test, you got symptoms here, and you find, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm infectious and infected. I'll keep on taste, taking these tests until I'm no longer symptomatic, and then I'm fine to go. If you've been vaccinated, the magical thing about vaccines is that they create a response. So as soon as you've been exposed to the virus, the vaccines kick in and say, hey, you know what? My immune system has seen this before. The vaccine showed me, I better start producing mucus. I better start getting this guy to sneeze and cough and stuff. That's what the symptoms are. Symptoms are, are immune reaction. But you haven't gotten a viral load yet to be infectious or indeed to be testable on the rapid test. So the guidance for um, vaccinated people in the wake of Omicron is, if you've got symptoms, uh, wait a day before testing or test yourself if you're negative, don't trust it. Wait a day or two, test again, because that gives your body time to mount more viral load such that you will test positive on the rapid test. And when can you stop being concerned? If you test negative on a rapid test twice in a 24 hour period, then I am fairly confident that there is a low probability that you are still infectious. So test negative twice on a rapid test, 24 hours apart. Okay, it's a lot of stuff, right? Uh, reinfection. Everyone's getting infected all the time. Uh, and this to me really suggests that, you know, if you've caught Omicron, it's not a good preventative against further infection because people are getting infected four or five, six times in a row now. So clearly something's going on there, right? Um, there is some concern that reinfection is not good. Um, some immunologists, point to something called a super antigen, which I don't fully understand, but the idea here is that uh, uh, COVID, its effect on your body uh, is to hobble your immune system so that you're unable to prevent further infection or indeed other diseases later on. I don't fully understand it, that's the immunologist talking, but there is one study out of the uh, Veteran Affairs Office in the US that looked at um, people getting infected again and again, and found that of the people who got one infection, um, those who got a reinfection had double the risk of dying of any cause. Very concerning, right? It suggests that every time you become infected, you increase your chance of something bad happening to you down the road, hospitalization, death, maybe by a heart attack or a stroke or something like that. It's, it's a concerning study. 
Um, the pushback is uh, the subjects were biased. They were like older and more likely to be ill. So maybe this is a specialized population, who knows? Um, we do know that vaccines lower the severity and duration of disease. Therefore, it's possible that the reinfections will be less severe than the first infections because you're building you know, um, more antibodies. Uh, and anecdotally, that seems to be what people are reporting. Hey, I, the second time I got COVID, it wasn't that big of a deal. Uh, maybe the subjective experience is better. It's unclear what it's doing to your immune system. Long COVID, which we haven't talked about yet, um, is that boogeyman waiting in the closet to scare us when this is all over. It, I think it's going to be a big issue for years, if not decades to come. But it looks like long COVID is related to the severity of disease. So if you can minimize the severity of your infection, you may have a lesser chance of getting long COVID. So um, maybe reinfections are less likely to have the effects of long COVID because they're less severe. It's, this is all hand-waving. Nobody really knows. Nobody really knows, right? So um, that's my word of <laughs> uh, not reassuring this. Okay, let's talk about mitigation tools. What can we do then if you don't want to become infected? And by the way, I don't think you should become reinfected. I think you should do everything in your power um, short of locking yourself at home. You know, let's live our lives, all that cool stuff, but let's take the necessary steps to avoid reinfection. But, and these steps aren't too onerous. Yeah, masks work. Uh, I don't know where this narrative comes from. They don't work. Of course they work. The data is pretty clear on this. They work well enough. And the respirator style masks, the N95s, KN95s, and so forth, work really well. So if you can wear a mask when you're in an indoor setting with people whose status you don't know, that will help. It would be great if everyone wore the mask. That would reduce the risk substantially. But because a lot of people aren't wearing masks, if you wear an N95, your risk comes down noticeably. Vaccines, do they work? Of course they work. We talked about that already. Um, they reduce your risk of both infection and of the worst outcomes. Uh, social distancing, I'm, you know, we're talking here about an airborne disease. Uh, the whole one or two meter rule doesn't apply to an airborne disease if you're indoors with someone for a long period of time. So I don't put a lot of stock in distancing. It does, it does something, absolutely. But I don't think you get your biggest bang for your buck with distancing. Uh, that's not to say you should not distance. It's just that don't bank on it. Cleaning surfaces? Nah. <laughs> that's hygiene theater. It's good for the common cold, good for the flu, good for monkeypox. Not good for COVID. Ventilation is the big one. Um, so if you don't know, COVID is airborne. And ventilation is the single most underutilized high-impact tool we have in our arsenal. That means windows open, HEPA filters if you can, building something called a Corsi Rosenthal box, which you can build for under 100 bucks yourself using fans and furnace filters you can buy from Walmart. Does a very good job of lowering the risk. Um, I got myself a portable CO2 monitor so you can carry it around and check the status of ventilation in a room that I'm lecturing in or have a meeting in or something. And um, the idea is if you, if you can keep the CO2 levels around that which you would expect from outside, which is like 400 um, nanoparticles, whatever the units are, particles per nanometer, whatever it is, um, then you've got good ventilation. Uh, for those watching this recording later on, uh, ordinarily, I do know the units, but not today. <laughs> okay, ventilation is a good one. Um, this is my last slide. So some issues that maybe you want to talk about that maybe are coming down the pipeline are new vaccines. So there are some extraordinarily good technologies that are coming down the pathway that I think are going to change the scope of this experience dramatically. Um, the intranasal vaccines are really impressive. We've had intranasal vaccines for other diseases. We tried them for influenza in the past, and we have them in the veterinary population, so horses and dogs. And the idea here is, if you can imagine a fight breaking out in a nightclub, um, you can send your thugs in to get the, the fighters out which is kind of difficult, or you can keep them from coming in in the first place by having bouncers at the door, which is what nightclubs do, right? Keep the bad people outside. That's what intranasal vaccines do. They're the bouncers that keep the virus out in the first place. Because Omicron in particular enters mostly through your nose, through the mucosa of your uh, nasal and oral passages. And if you can mount your immune response there, 
then you have a much better chance of keeping infection out of your body entirely. And if you can't become infected, then you can't pass it on. The clinical trials so far are impressive. Um, they've got to, of course, check for uh, safety issues. Uh, uh, maybe it increases your chances of asthma. I don't know. I just made that up. It's possible. So we can't just rush this stuff. Um, the Russians claim to have one ready to go to market. I think the Chinese have one ready to go to market. The Indians have one ready to go to market. So everyone's moving on this pretty fast. Um, Western, quote unquote, Western countries have many dozens of these candidates being trialed. It's unclear if any drug company is going to jump on them rapidly because I haven't got the same amount of government backing that Project Warp Speed offered to the first batch of vaccines. So I think that's a mistake. I'd like to see government really focus more on underwriting the risks associated with producing intranasal vaccines because that could be a big game changer. Um, the second thing I have here is the pan-coronavirus vaccine. That's a vaccine that, in theory, could account for all variants, current, past, and future. That would be nice, right? Not have to worry about updating the vaccines. So uh, people are working on that. The Chinese and Cubans claim to have one, but I've seen no data on this. So we'll see. Uh, bivalent boosters are making the news. The one we have in Canada is tuned to BA1. So what is a bivalent booster, first of all? It's one that includes two versions of the virus, the original Wuhan version and the Omicron version. Now, the, the Omicron version in, one in Canada is the BA1 subvariant, but we don't have BA1 anymore in Canada. The Americans have one that's tuned to BA5, which makes a little more sense. And the reason for that is administrative. Um, the data is unclear. Um, it looks like an Omicron booster will produce more antibodies against Omicron to the order of like 22% more than would the original booster. But you get your biggest advantage from being boosted by anything. So I've been boosted by the original uh, formulation. Um, and that's, so I'm teaming with antibodies. So most of the antibodies you get will be from just getting boosted. Getting boosted with a bivalent gives you an additional 22% more. Um, so yeah, uh, I encourage everyone to get boosted. And if you can get boosted with the bivalent one, do so. Uh, vaccine for kids, we have them now for kids under five. I have a kid under five and he's had one shot. Um, the data is not fantastic, but it's something. Uh, you get somewhere between 37 and 52% protection against symptomatic disease. Um, but the protection against hospitalization and death is probably much higher than that. So uh, I encourage you to consider it. I would never tell a parent what to do with their child. I understand there are risks associated, but we chose to get uh, our child vaccinated. And I ask you to consider it given the high number of pediatric hospitalizations happening. So um, those are all my slides. I will stop sharing. And if you have any questions or comments, I am happy to take them. You're muted, Pema. I have to do that at least once during every Zoom, right? <laughs> so thank you for that. I think that that covered a, um, pretty much everything that um, I was thinking of when I asked you to do this. So that's great. I'm looking, does anybody, um, anybody want to, uh, if anyone wants to speak or, or ask a question, please, you could either use your little hand. Oh, I see Emily has her hand up. I will, Emily, uh, I'll allow you to talk, but I can also promote you to a panelist if you like. Let me see. How can I do this? One second. Promote to panelist. There we are. If you're willing. There. Okay, well, yeah, thank you very much um, for this briefing and for your previous briefings. And I uh, am a frequent news watcher, so I, I see you, I follow you. Um, yeah, I think you're a really important resource and we're really lucky to have you around. So thank you very much. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a bit much, a bit more about to what um, what is expected to happen this fall. Uh, I've heard that Australia was a huge mess with influenza um, also being a big problem. And 
Um, maybe, you know, obviously you don't have a crystal ball, but some of the predictions that we can expect and, um, you know, Omicron was a surprise. Do we expect a, you know, Omni, Omni, Omicron or what kind of, you know, are we expecting variations to, to get variants to get so bad that, you know, it could become yeah. more of a problem or do we think that with vaccinations, hopefully the lethal lethality will remain similar. So thank That's you. That's the endless question. Thank you for that question. Um, first, uh, there are three categories of variants, um, VOIs, VOCs, and VOHCs. So VOIs are variants of interest, VOCs are variants of concern, and VOHCs are variants of high consequence. And the difference between them is the extent to which these variants compromise our ability to detect, treat, and prevent disease. There have been many, many, many VOIs since this pandemic began. You don't hear about them all because they don't make the news. There have been about a handful, a dozen, I lost count of VOCs, uh, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, um, omicron, and then the subvariants thereof. And some don't make the news of there either. Um, there have been no variants of high consequence, meaning that their vaccines continue to be effective against every variant we've seen. Our testing apparatus continues to be effective against every variant we've seen. And our ability to treat, you know, to the extent that we have the ability to treat has been uncompromised so far. So I don't expect that to change. Could be wrong, don't expect it to change. Why do variants emerge in the first place? They emerge because we allow rampant transmission in places with limited population immunity. We're at the point where so much of the world has been infected that there is some population immunity floating around almost everywhere, either through vaccination or through infection. It may be you know, transient uh, immunity, but it still exists to some extent. So I feel, and I could be wrong about this, but I feel the ability to produce variants is diminishing, but certainly hasn't gone away, has not gone away at all. Uh, in fact, we seem to be producing um, subvariants at a faster rate. But subvariants of Omicron are still Omicron. And so they will respond to our Omicron specific vaccines, at least somewhat. So I'm not overly concerned about um, new variants popping up and really destroying society. I'm concerned about new variants popping up and giving us some challenge in vaccine effectiveness. So that's not where my focus is. And by the way, I could be 100% wrong. What do I know? <laughs> Death jockey. Uh, there are people who study this more in depthly than I do who probably disagree with me 100%. I don't know, but that's my gut feeling. Um, Thanks. Uh, so I see we have Madeline uh, who had her hand up and then I'm we've sorry. got now four questions in the chat. So maybe okay, we can let Madeline go and then we can go down the questions. Sure. Madeline, go ahead. Can you yeah, unmute? Sorry, my, my computer is a little bit slow in responding to some things. So I think you can hear me, not if you can see me. Um, here I am. Um, so I wanted to ask about some, some of the language that we're using um, for sort of COVID, because it feels like generally right now in the process of things, it feels when we talk about when we talk about the acute phase when someone has a positive test and of course you know between this started in 2020 and most recently that makes sense because until we got an like a good vaccine rollout and all of that that really did appear to be the period of concern and now i'm seeing a lot of discussion and study early still and and lots of lack of understanding of causal mechanisms but the it's being sort of like long covid is is the phrase that's being uh, given to that but i also wonder if maybe the language is going to become a little bit more specific as time goes on because there we're seeing so we see excess deaths they're called excess deaths um you know people they have an acute infection um and and lots of discussion where that seems to be a mild experience and yet now i mean there's sort of a joke we have an outbreak of sudden death syndrome <laughs> among a bunch of people and it's not just the elderly and the um you know people that we might say have underlying health conditions um like as you were saying children 
Um, and I don't actually know, I, I think it says like under 18, but I don't know if we've got those age ranges broken down. Um, and then like, so is it just super young children because they're more vulnerable? Is it more, is it people with disabilities? Um, and, but you also hear a whole bunch of really, um, what would be considered really healthy young people in their teens or twenties or thirties that suddenly have a stroke and die, suddenly have a heart attack and die. And that's just one element of things. There's a bunch of other stories of people talking about, well, I had a really mild illness. And then three months later or six months later, I, um, I can't climb the stairs anymore, or I, you know, my heart just keeps racing, or um, I developed type one diabetes, or suddenly have these rashes that just come and go, or you know, anyway, this enormous range of symptoms that may or may not hang around, and that not everyone is always tying into a COVID infection um, unless you start asking for a bunch of things, and this seems to now be the space where there's a huge amount of risk, at least it feels to me a huge amount of risk, even though, um, you know, not for all the reasons that you discussed, I'm not so worried, really, I mean, I am worried, but not about the immediate responses from an acute infection. When I have a positive test, I've gotten through that once, got through it with a, another kid and prevented it in, in the rest of the household. That's great. I'm happy for that. But what's going to happen to me down the road? What's going to happen to my kids down the road? And we don't know that. And that's where there's like, I have a lot of fear around that. Okay, there's a lot to unpack there. First, let's talk about the um, sudden adult, adult death syndrome. That's a real thing that's been monitored for many years. And usually it has to do with um, undiagnosed heart issues. And uh, I have some disagreements with some colleagues about this because all of the sudden adult deaths that you mentioned are anecdotal. They occurred, the deaths occurred, but we've always observed that even before the pandemic. Just now they get reported a lot. So the question now is, is that happening more than it did before the pandemic or is it increased as a result of the pandemic? Nobody knows because the data, I've not seen it yet. If it has happened, it is happening more since the pandemic, then there is some suggestion that something uh, involving infection is responsible. And that plays into what the immune, some immunologists are calling the super antigen effect, which is concerning, right? We know that COVID does have an effect on circulation, on the, uh, our nervous systems. So stroke, heart disease, that seems to be, uh, it seems rational, they be connected. Nobody knows. That's the sad part. So we're not going to know really well for years, if not decades later. Part of the problem is that you say, um, hey, this person got a stroke uh, like six months later. And we only now found out, hey, they were infected six months ago. The problem is now is almost everyone's been infected. So how do you tease out the risk of that versus of not having been infected? It's hard to say. Um, I'm not offering much comfort there, I know, except to say epidemiologically, I am not ready to pull the trigger on this sudden death thing until I see actual data, not news reports. Okay, so put that aside. Um, something else you mentioned there about um, uh, defining, uh, someone else asked in the Q&A, defining long COVID, for example, that's part of your question, I think. The, there is no official definition. The, the current definition seems to be symptoms lasting more than X weeks after infection. And that's a very, very weak definition. So one American study by that definition found that 20% of all infected people have long COVID, which means like, you know, a lot of Americans, like a very large proportion of Americans and so many have been infected have, uh, uh, have long COVID. Um, this is all being worked through by the scientists and you won't have a proper answer for years, sadly. We will have though, again, better vaccines and better treatments before we have proper answers. That's the good news. In the meantime, the best we can do is try to avoid becoming infected um, I will say that uh, there's an interesting study I was looking at recently showing that what are the risk factors for long COVID and long-term impacts of infection? And among the, uh, the interesting statistical signals was cortisol levels. So bodily stress levels seem to be associated with bad outcomes down the road. That's not to say your mental stress, just keeping yourself overall healthy and less likely to produce cortisol, the stress hormone, might have a protective effect. I can make some hand-waving conclusions from that one study. More studies like that will come out and give us a better handle on how to do this. But we're entering a scary time in medical history, I think. The next few years is going to be interesting and 
challenging and expensive for a healthcare system and for us as individuals? Unsatisfactory yeah. answer, I know. That's well, I think we've got a couple questions in the the chat that kind of you know make a good segue from from this. I mean, one I think you answered about uh, extended family having symptoms of COVID and a reluctance to diagnose. It's just sorry you're sick. It sounds like there isn't really a a standard definition of long long COVID. And then the other one is how do you suggest that we assess personal risk given the reduction in information about caseloads? I what asked are that recommendations? every week by journalists. Yes, yes. Um, but uh, I think, you know, one of the problems with humans, and you guys have a background in this, you and Madeline and others that I don't, but I do, I do think that people are like a lot of us never really thought about this stuff before, right? So all of a sudden people are hearing about like, oh, you could still have symptoms of a viral infection, you know, months or weeks after. Well, I had a bad cold once uh, several years ago and I, I had post-viral syndrome or something, what they called. And I went to the doctor and I'm like, I had a bad cold and I, I still feel like crap. And, you know, she said, you've got post viral syndrome, it's happening with this particular bad cold this year, take it easy for a few more weeks, and you'll get better. And I did, you know, and I think that people, I mean, I'm not trying to minimize this, because I'm absolutely scared of long COVID and all of that stuff, too. But I think that people, you know, people don't know, people think they're, they were very, very safe from all this stuff before, and they were not. And so now, they think, oh my God, I have this extra risk that I didn't before. And I think it makes it hard for us to, to assess these things. Anyway, I will, okay. I will sure. shut up now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I'm conscious of time, so I'll answer these questions quickly. Assessing personal risk is, of course, a, a, a uh, adventure in assessing personal values. There are tools we can use. Um, I have a small child, so my tolerance of risk is much lower than my single friends who are childless who can go off partying all the time and, yeah, I get COVID, big deal, I'll deal with it later. I don't want to give my child COVID. So I don't attend the social gatherings. And I'm going to my first indoor dinner later this week because it's a dinner in my honor. I have to go, right? So I'll be unmasked for the first time. I'm terrified. So that's why I have a portable CO2 monitor that comes with me to monitor exactly how, how the uh, ventilation quality is. I always wear a mask if I'm in an indoor situation. And um, there's nothing wrong about that. And I try to make sure I socialize with people who are vaccinated. Um, that doesn't guarantee a lack of infection, but it helps. Having symptom checks, making sure you're not associating with people who are symptomatic, that will help enormously as well. But uh, managing your own personal risk comes down to what you are individually able to tolerate in terms of your values, your social life, and your, your expectations. Unfortunately, that's the only answer I can offer. Um, I see, uh, I'll go on the list here. Uh, Nancy has, um, those of us who already had four shots, uh, should we consider having a bivalent booster? I would say yes. I would say yes. Um, not immediately, you know, wait a few months. There is there's a, a iterative lack of effectiveness if you wait too soon. Um, waiting longer gives your tissues a time to reduce inflammation, tends to mount a better reaction time. The immunologists, again, are unclear on this, undecided, but yeah. Um, or you can hold that and wait for all these powerful intranasal vaccines that are coming. But I personally will, will seek a bivalent vaccine in the new year when um, a few months have passed since uh, my last dose. Uh, next one, uh, anonymous attendee. Conspiracy theory followers are bombarded with numbers of people dying from the shots. <laughs> it's almost zero. I mean, AstraZeneca had some problems with their um, bleeding issues, but on the Ontario data I know pretty well there have been no confirmed cases of deaths from uh, literally over 15 million doses. Globally, we're looking at over 12 billion doses administered. There is no epidemic of vaccine deaths. It's complete nonsense. And um, it's nonsense because there is a database called VAERS, V-A-E-R-S, Vaccine Adverse Reaction Resource Database, which is nonsense. Anyone can submit a VAERS report, many people do. Uh, they associate their gunshot deaths to the vaccine. And so if you were to analyze that data uncritically, as many do, you get an astonishingly high vaccine adverse reaction signal, which is, the vaccines are astonishingly safe. Um, there's a recent study uh, suggesting that the adverse reaction rates amongst the vaccinated are higher than the hospitalization rates amongst um, people who got COVID. It's being shared by anti-vaxxers left and right, written by some top-notch scientists. It's a crap study. 
it's astonishingly bad. And I'm embarrassed by my profession that I was allowed to be published. On my blog, I've dissected what's wrong with that study. And I would, I would be surprised if that if a journal doesn't retract it soon. That kind of stuff does enormous damage. Uh, next question by Kale Husband. Could I, sorry, could I uh, oh, just sorry. ask a quick question? But why do they do things like that? I mean, the PR? Is it, I don't know. Why, yeah. like, why would someone, what is the motivation behind a group of scientists publishing something like that? My first thought was they, they suck at statistics, but one of the authors is a statistics guru. Um, the one I once had a very public disagreement with 20 years ago. So <laughs> uh, I, I, my first thought is he, they weren't really involved. Their students were involved and they signed off on it. Uh, or they knew this will get some attention, as it did. So th there, are, I, I don't attribute to maliciousness what I can be explained by just uh, incompetence or lack of oversight. I think it's probably the latter. I'm more concerned that it went through peer review and no one caught this nonsense. Um, anyway, uh, next question. Uh, how effective are cloth masks? I guess. So uh, the effectiveness of masks against variants hasn't changed. What's changed is our understanding of how the virus works. Cloth masks work to some extent. This, this is a, an airborne virus. So just covering your face with a, a baggy cloth mask won't stop stuff from getting out the sides and floating around the air, like cigarette smoke. Um, it will stop it from getting to someone directly in front of you. So it does something, it does something. Uh, but the N95s work really well to contain that cigarette smoke. The new variants are more contagious not for reasons having to do with mask effectiveness. They're more contagious for reasons having to do with shortened incubation periods and lesser viral load needed to infect people, lesser infectious dose. So the, the masks work fine. Uh, where can I get a reliable CO2 monitor? Amazon. I got mine on Amazon. <laughs> uh, just Google the best ones. There's a lot of work being done on good ones. Wow, those are all the, the questions are gone. Nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so they, somebody asked earlier though about uh, the flu season and that I do want to talk about that for a second. In Australia, yes, there was a, an enormous early flu season caused mostly by suddenly we're not taking precautions anymore. So the flu came roaring back. I expect that to happen here. So uh, get your flu shot when it comes available and let's not overwhelm the healthcare system. I expect we're going to be looking at a fairly stressed healthcare system in the fall. I don't think the you know, the serious COVID cases are going to be world crippling and society ending. It's just that a pillar of society or healthcare system may crumble. I'm quite concerned about that. I see Madeline's got her hand up there. Madeline, go ahead. Uh, again, the slowness of my computer. Sorry, I'm just putting in the chat um, a resource uh, that's been proven to be really good on talking about masks, what works, what doesn't, and then reviews of different types of masks. Um, so thank you for anybody. It's from a, a, a website called Clean Air Crew. So they talk a lot about stuff. They've also got the instructions on the Corsi Rosenthal boxes uh, that Ray mentioned. I also made one at home, it oh, really nice. worked. You it was one of the major core. things to prevent. <laughs> um, yeah, because you had a yeah, I mean, minute, right? it's interesting it's because a lot of them nobody else got it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So a lot of them are made with four furnace filters and the MERV 13 ones are a little bit more expensive. So you can spend like a hundred bucks on getting the MERV 13 filters about 25 bucks a piece plus the box fan and the tape. Anyway, there's instructions for a one filter uh, fan and that's what we did. So that made it super portable. Um, and I just took it around with my daughter everywhere she was. Uh, she's the <laughs> one who was sick. And uh, I wore a mask. We opened all the windows, turned on all the fans, including uh, furnace built furnace fan and, and bathroom fan. And I mean, my kids even sleep together and they often come and crawl in bed with me. And we would not, um, myself and my son, we didn't get sick. And my daughter, she, you know, she went through the infectious period and finally tested negative and we didn't get sick. And considering we're in the same house and when that happened, the same thing happened last April and everybody got sick. So this was a, a different approach and we didn't get sick. So really happy. It's that. magical. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. That was, had we had this simple technology two years ago, how different the experience would have been, huh? Well, and, and what had we admitted earlier right. that it was airborne, right? I mean, you know, and I remember doctor friends of mine saying, 
from their experience in in their clinics and stuff saying it's freaking airborne like why are we i argued this in a court of law and have lost <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because public health brings out their own experts who well, back then they did to claim that it wasn't airborne and of course the court yeah yeah exactly. well and you know but this is a <laughs> this is an important thing for institutions right like like us you know like like unions like um like the government employers who you know at a certain point you have to say we have to go with some reliable sources and we said with PAFSO, you know, we're going to go with, you know, the Canadian public health officials, World Health Organization, so on, because we don't have the scientific capacity ourselves to do a sort of independent analysis and assess all these things. But then when you see them being very conservative, um, I mean, at a certain point, I think you have to you know, you have to admit what's what's going on. The question is always, where is that point? Um, so, Ray, what we we asked we we asked for an hour of your time, and we're coming up on exactly twelve fifty nine. I have a little bit more time, so if people, if you're willing to stay, if people have other questions, sure. if there are more questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, then you know, if anybody raise your hand or or start uh, start typing, and we could look at them. Um, oh, I see Emily. Emily, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, I I was wondering, um, you know, there was a lot of talk about Paxlovid for a while. And then I know several elderly people who were infected and went through their infections. And when I asked them if they ever looked into Paxlovid, they were kind of like not really aware that it was an option. And, you know, like my father, who's in his late 70s, you know, and has a heart condition, and his was a two week almost infection. And, you know, I'm just wondering, um, is is it because it's not that effective or why isn't it being promoted more? It, yeah, it's good so question. Hard to access? It's a good question. So we have a lot of it <laughs> it's not being used. Part of it is, and I get this from my physician spouse, that there's so many contraindications for it, so many drug interactions that a lot of the people who need it can't take it because there are other medications that it interferes with. So really it's a, a specialized population that can really benefit from it. Uh, we hear about the, the rebound aspects of it too. So you take it and the symptoms go away, then a week later they come roaring back. So they're still you know, figuring out what the dosage schedule has to be to prevent that rebound effect. So a lot of work is being done there. But I think part of the reason is um, A, doctors are you know, overworked and confused and under-informed, and B, this the drug interaction phenomenon. So I would like the pharmacists to be better involved in that process. In the US, the, the model was test to treat. So you show up at the pharmacist, you get a test right there to see if you got COVID, and they hand you the drug so that you're treated right away. Um, I'm not sure if that's still happening, but that's kind of ideal because the pharmacists are better equipped to figure out the interaction issues. Thanks, Emily. Does that answer you? That that sounds like that answers your question to my it, uneducated. It does, and I have more questions in the bank if needed. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, I'm. I just want to yeah. give folks a a chance. Um, if anybody hasn't um, hasn't um said anything yet but go go ahead while we while yeah, we wait well, for other I was just you know as a lot of uh, postings are starting now for foreign service officers and there's a lot of travel just your thoughts on the continued approach of uh, of the government to be testing um at borders or you know that those kind of policies continuing yeah um your so views on the, will, the actual me, effectiveness of that. Let me plug uh, uh, an event I'll be speaking at later next month called Borders and Pandemics. We are the Ottawa U um, Law Faculty is hosting this conference. I'll, I'll send a link to Pamela as you can see later on. We need more people attending. Um, anyway, so the idea there is to talk about the legal, ethical, and public health aspects of these border restrictions and testing. And um, Throughout the pandemic, it's been clear to me that the countries have, that have responded well had three things in common. One, they got really good at testing. Two, they acted early, they acted hard. And three, they got really good at monitoring their borders for importation of infection. Now, maybe the gate 
has been open too long for that to be effective anymore. That used to be good for preventing importation of a new variants, for example, but too late for that. I still think there's something to be said for understanding exactly where your cases come from. Not necessarily restricting access, but certainly testing to see if there is you know, uh, an issue with importation of new infection. And certainly as new variants emerge, we can detect those by testing for them. So scientifically, there is a strong utility for it. Ethically, functionally, I, I don't know whether it um, uh, will affect the ability to uh, conduct border uh, management as easily anymore, but I advocate for the continued testing of people coming across the border. If for no other reason, you can offer them resources if you're infected. Right? Maybe you don't know you're infected. Now you do know and we can offer you a vaccine, maybe Paxlovid, maybe a rapid test, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's also something to be said for the ethics of public health allowing Canadians to be infected by knowingly allowing infected individuals to cross into the country. And similarly, knowingly infecting other nations by knowingly allowing your infected people to go forth and infect others. So ethically, I'm in favor of that as well. Uh, and no one ever managed anything better with less information. More information is always preferred. Comes down to how you use that information. How's that for a wishy-washy answer? <laughs> that is, can I just add, ask a, a sort of follow-up question? I'm wondering, like, is there any thought to offering people antibody tests as a sort of standard thing? Because, for example, as far as I know, I have not ever had a COVID infection touch wood. But, you know, I keep reading articles that say, oh, you think you might not be infected, but think again, you probably have been. How am I ever going to, how are we ever going to find that out? Like, I think they would have to sort of, when you go for your physical, start saying, hey, let's do a, you know, yeah, let's yeah, do people, a check. And yeah, are they going to do that? They might, as they get cheaper, they might. And you, you can do a test now to determine if you got your antibodies from infection versus from vaccination. Um, but so many people have been vaccinated now that, you know, it doesn't really matter if you've been infected. It means you've got antibodies for both. Um, I think it oh, matters if, if, you know, if you've got, if we down the line, we discover a certain category of long COVID diagnosis that is truly problematic and it matters whether or not you're diagnosed with that versus something similar. If it matters to the treatment outcome, then you can pursue it. But clinically, it comes down to what additional information will that give us to allow us to treat you differently? I'm not sure that that's the case yet. So I, I doubt that would be the case. Okay, thanks. I see we did have a question in the chat from Kale about the asking for your assessment on the global vaccine, yeah. vaccine rollout. In a word, it's been crap. Um, and we have failed to, for example, we're rolling out fourth and fifth doses when there are people in the world who haven't had first doses. Uh, and so ethically, there is an issue there. Um, also, like we have bivalent doses coming now, which means we have buttloads of the previous version being unused. Is it ethical to give away those previous doses when they're not optimal anymore, rather than throwing them away? I don't know. Uh, um, it's kind of like giving away your expired pharmaceuticals to poor countries, as we do. Yeah, so it's hard. Well, if they don't have anything, you know. Yeah, but also, isn't it better to hey? Instead of having my used clothing, I have the wherewithal to produce new clothing for you. So why don't I do that instead? Yeah, um, yeah. But into that void, you know, the Russians and the Chinese have come to to produce their vaccines, which have you know questionable efficacy. Um, and globally, the mRNA vaccines, I think, were never going to be the solution to the global problem because they can't be manufactured as as quickly and they can't be stored as well and so forth. There's always going to be the viral vector vaccines like AstraZeneca. Um, that was going to be the world's salvation. And it looks like um, nations like India are producing that one and their own version and sharing that widely. So uh, I, I think it's less of an issue every day because of the capacity for manufacturing and the fact that many people are producing their own versions now. But yeah, it's shameful the way it unfolds, absolutely shameful. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Thank you for that. It's a, Emily, I'm not seeing, I don't have other questions. So Emily, did you have more? No, I think it's fine. The The other question I had, he did sort of address uh, a bit, you know, was thinking of sort of for people who had been recently infected, 
um, in say June, you know, July. And um, so they're due for their next booster three months, you know, I think the Ontario government saying 84 days after something. So then, um, you know, mid-September-ish. So then decisions being made whether to make, wait for the bivalent vaccine to go ahead now, or even if it's like two weeks, should I go earlier because I know I'm going to return to work and be in an environment where I'm around A a couple of weeks plus or minus isn't going to make that much of a difference. I do want to add a little, little bit of hesitation here. There's something called original antigenic sin or immune imprinting is sometimes called. And again, I'm not an immunologist. So my explanation of this will be you know, less than optimal, but it's that if you continue to be boosted for one version of the virus, your body gets used to that. And then its ability to respond to future versions might be compromised. That's a fear. It hasn't yet been observed yet. And there are strategies for overcoming it at the population level. Uh, for flu vaccines, for example, are messed with all the time, so they, they don't produce that effect. But um, I mention only because for some people advocate that we can just continue boosting every three or four months indefinitely. Probably can't because of this, this effect called original antigenic sin. Um, so this can't be our permanent state of affairs over the next few years. It probably can be over the next one or two years. Um, but for the, the short term, yeah, you can get boosted you know, uh, within a few months after your last infection or, or boost. But we need better long lasting vaccines to avoid that immune imprinting effect. Maybe I shouldn't have mentioned that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a really interesting consideration just to add to, you know, everyone's going to weigh their considerations individually. So I appreciate that added information. I think it's important to consider. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I just I saw that there was one question in the chat asking if GAC is going to require proof of boosters. So far, they have not indicated that. Um, but I think that what they're doing is they're um, the federal government as a whole is looking at you know what Health Canada's definition of fully vaccinated is. And if the definition of fully vaccinated becomes, you know, you have to have had a booster, then they will enforce that with. Um, I think it should. I think it should yeah. be three three doses. But uh. yeah, I mean, I, I I understand there's a whole thing that goes that goes into that. But you know, anybody who um, you know the the vaccination policy is still in place. Um, they they you know they they've just sort of suspended it. Um, for for now, but they they have not removed it. So um, you know, people should be aware that if the definition of fully vaccinated changes, then there could be the employer could require proof of that fully vaccinated status, the new status um, from from people. As unions, you know, we um, we have concerns about these uh, the you know this in terms of medical privacy and and so on and and so forth, but it is something that they have the right to do. So, um, you know, we, our obligation is to inform people and to make sure that, um, you know, any um, requests for any, you know, exemptions or things like that are given a fair hearing and those kinds of, those kinds of things, but it is something that they do have the, have the right to, uh, to require of us. So I see a couple of uh, thank yous for the uh, excellent um, excellent event and the excellent answers. Maybe what I will do, and thank you for me as well, of course, but what I will do is I will pause the recording or, or end the recording just so that uh, we can say good we can say goodbye and thank you very much for for taking the time and being so open with us. Um, Oh, I just saw one more thing. Oh, another thank you. Um, and um, I will pause the recording or I'll end the recording just so in case anybody has anything they'd like to ask and not that, that they don't want on the record. So.